people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say that's the bad guy. That's the bad guy. Okay, we'll start with this. Set the goal down on the undercard of Amanda Serrano versus Nina Menke. Puerto Rican amateur standout, Puerto Rican upstart, Crystal Rosario will be returning to action, attempting to advance to a professional record of 3-0 opposite the ring, unbeaten Gloria Munguia in what is a battle of the unbeatens, unbeaten Gloria, unbeaten Crystal. Gloria, who's 11 years older than young Crystal. Gloria's 32, whereas Crystal's 21. 21 years old, the young protege of Amandia Serrano, what looks to be the heir apparent to the Puerto Rican throne of boxing on the women's end of it, the women's side of it. She's got potential. What you see in Crystal Rosado is what you see in Carolyn Dubois, yeah. Beatrice Ferreira up there at lightweight. It's speed, it's power, yeah. combinations, ferocity. Urgency. Scheduled for four rounds in the women's super flyweight division. Super flyweight, that's 115 pounds. That's where Mexico's own Irma Garcia holds the IBF title. Oh. Mexico's own Ashley Gonzalez. She's got the WBC, Japan's own Mizuki Hiruta. She's got the WBO and Argentina's own Clara Lescurat. She's got the W. UBA. And that's where Crystal Rosario currently campaigns. That's where Crystal Rosario will be taking on Gloria Munguia. Gloria, who last saw action in August of last year. Gloria. Gloria debuted as a professional in late 2022 in November. She fought once, only once that year, and fought four times last year. And she's going to have her hands full with Crystal, who, as stated, all the things you see in Carolyn Dubois, all the things you see in Beatrice Ferreira, that's what you see from Crystal. Crystal, who debuted as a professional in August of last year. She fought two times last year, once in August, then again in October. She's collected the scalps of two unbeaten fighters. Two unbeaten fighters so far. Could Gloria Munguia be the third? Crystal Rosario, a most valuable promotions fighter that is managed by none other than Amandia Serrano herself. Grooming this young Puerto Rican fighter, this young Puerto Rican talent, she will be making her next ring appearance in Amandia Serrano's homecoming fight in Puerto Rico, in El Coliseo. Coliseo. Now, in my previous video, we talked about the surge of talented up-and-comers, unbeaten ones, in the super flyweight division. In my previous video, we talked about Shannon Ryan, unbeaten Shannon Ryan of the United Kingdom and how she's going to be returning to action. One of several unbeaten up-and-comers at this weight. You have Shannon Ryan, Emma Dolan, America's own Liana Cruz, and... Crystal Rosario of Puerto Rico. Super flyweight's got talent. This is a very deep, deep division, a deep weight class that often gets overlooked. Other divisions like 118 pounds, 122, 126, 130, 135, they get a lot more coverage. Those fighters that campaign at those weights, they often get more exposure than the girls at 115, than the girls at Superfly. But when a major promotional outfit with a broadcast partner, with a platform, has an unbeaten fighter campaigning at a given weight, starts to lend itself to that division's exposure and how much coverage it gets. So when a matchroom has an unbeaten up and comer in a Shannon Ryan campaigning at Superfly, when a most valuable promotions has a Crystal Rosario campaigning painting at that same weight it has a positive effect on a division and it's better for everybody it's better overall in tandem with all the unbeaten up and comers the proliferation of up and comers at this weight there are also four reigning world champions and that's four separate paths to a world title so in the next two to three years the landscape could definitely change as titles start to change hands and crystal rosario being of puerto rican descent in a very general sense the puerto ricans are a very proud people and as it pertains to boxing they can be fiercely loyal to their fighters so long as their fighters are on the level and I think Crystal Rosado is on the level. I think she's got what it takes to carry the flag and represent Puerto Rican boxing in the next era, the next generation. 
Remember that she's only 21 years old. She's got plenty of good years to give to the sport of boxing. And because she's only 21, that means her body is still growing. She might be at 115 now, but her future lies at 118, 122, 126. She might top out at 130. 126 or 130, you know the girls fluctuate in weight a lot more than the guys do, so it's entirely possible that Crystal Rosado could one day see herself campaigning as a super featherweight. For now, she's at super flyweight, and I like what I see. Keep your eyes peeled for the ring return of Crystal Rosado on the undercard of Serrano versus Menke. Yeah, lots of talks with, with Javante Davis. I mean, firstly, those two going back and forth, and you know, I've spoken to Javante personally, and he'll be receiving an offer from us today for that fight as well. I think it's a huge fight. Could happen in the UK, but we're looking, I think, in, in America for that. When Javante Davis first expressed an interest in facing Conor Ben this past weekend after Conor Ben's win over Pete Dobson, I didn't take it seriously. In some ways, I still don't, though just for argument's sake. For the sake of conversation, if Javante Davis is serious about Conor Ben, and he seems to be as communications, they are happening between the teams. Eddie Hearn confirms that he's talking to Javante Davis, though just the act of talking to him doesn't mean the fight happens. He's had communications with Javante Davis in the past, he has. many years ago, for what was supposed to be a Tevin Farmer fight, a Tevin Farmer unification match down there at 130, back when Javante had the WBA and Tevin had the IBF. This was before Javante debuted on pay-per-view and then like now there was a dialogue there was an exchange between the two teams but the fight didn't happen oh. this was before javante debuted on pay-per-view and eddie hearn offered javante something like seven or eight million dollars to come to their side of things to fight tevin farmer but obviously he didn't bite he didn't take the offer and i'm not sure that he's gonna take this one but on the predication that he is serious about fighting connor ben that this is a real inquiry a genuine inquiry a hard inquiry why Connor Ben and not Shakur Stevenson at 135? Why Connor Ben and not Devin Haney at 140? Why Connor Ben at potentially 147? Why him and not them? Maybe it's because Connor didn't look nothing too spectacular in his last fight. Yeah, but Shakur didn't look spectacular in his last fight. He looked pretty awful. And I didn't see Javante in any hurry to fight him. I saw Calvin Ford blow off the idea that Javante should fight Shakur Stevenson. And, and Devin Haney, he looked human after the Vasil Lomachenko fight, but once again, I didn't see Javante Davis stepping up to the plate on that predication that Devin looked human, arguably lost, and that would have been a good time to fight him. No, I didn't see Javante Davis step up to the plate. So why is he now stepping up to the plate for a naturally bigger fighter than those fighters? What gives? But if he's serious, what's the angle? Because there's always an angle with Javante. There's always some angling. There has to be because he's not as good as people think he is. So what's the angle? I don't even know that I want to waste any time talking about this or entertaining it because the fight could fall apart due to the offer that Javante Davis doesn't like the money. The fight could fall apart due to the weight, the contracted weight of the match. We know that Javante Davis likes to impose a lot of weight stipulations on his opponents. He put one on Mario Barrios. He put another on Ryan Garcia. If he's fighting a guy at 147 who campaigns at 147 or above, I try to put weight stipulations on him. Weight stipulations that Connor doesn't want to adhere to and that could cause the fight to fall apart so I don't know how much time I want to waste entertaining this conversation this fight but on the premise that he's serious that this is a genuine inquiry a hard inquiry perhaps the reason Javante Davis is more receptive to a Connor Ben fight instead of a Shakur Stevenson fight at 135 or a Devin Haney fight at 140. Perhaps it's due to the styles. You must remember that Conor Ben, for all his virtues, he's not as proven as those fighters are. He's not a champion. Shakur Stevenson's been a champion at three weights, Devin a champion at two. Conor's been a champion in none. He's not as proven as those fighters are and stylistically just based on styles based on styles right Conor ben's come forward aggressive style is easier for javante davis to deal with than the pure boxer style of shakur stevenson right? of devin haney because Conor's the kind of guy that's going to step into his punches to bring other punches over he's going to try to string together combinations he's going to close the distance try to overpower the other guy and that plays into javante davis's hands his counter punching he's a short stumpy fighter that relies on the other man's aggression to land hard counters and javante davis for him it's 
easier to deal with a guy like that, a guy who's going to close the distance, than a guy who's going to maintain distance, a guy who's going to stay behind the jab, box from the outside, move around. Connor is a lot more busy in a round than a Shakur Stevenson, more busy in a round than a Devin Haney. He throws punches in bunches, so you get lots of opportunities to catch him in between, whereas with a Devin Haney or a Shakur Stevenson, they're pot-shotting you. They're shooting singles from a safe distance. Staying on the outside where Connor Ben likes to work mid-range to inside, so there's the styles of the fighters that you have to consider, that if you're wondering why would Javante be more receptive to a fight with Connor than a fight with them, there's the styles of the fighters that you must consider, and there is also Connor's name value. He's the son of a legend. He's the son of Nigel Ben. He's not as accomplished or proven as Devin or Shakur, but he does have some marquee value in the United Kingdom, so when you think about billing this as a pay-per-view, that's two markets you have to draw from, the UK market and the US market. See the strategy. You know what the formula is, what the formula has been for Gervonta Davis. The most rewards for the least risks. That's what the Ryan Garcia fight was. A very popular guy who's not all that proven and isn't all that good, but he's worth some money. So if you fight him, you can make some money. You're saying Connor Ben is easy work for Gervonta. I'm saying Gervonta thinks he's easy work. That on the predication, he's actually interested in fighting him where he's never been all that interested in Devin or Shakur. That would be the why. That would be the reason. He sees something in Connor that he thinks he can exploit. And that's the only reason he wants to fight him. Thinks a fight with Connor would be easier than a fight with Devin, easier than a fight with Shakur. That if he's serious about fighting Connor, that would be the why and that would be the reason though i reiterate i'm not sure how serious he is or isn't and i'm not sure that anybody should hold their breath waiting for this fight to happen though if it does that would be why javante made good money in his last fight he wants to keep making good money but he wants to mitigate the risks at the same time and to him this isn't risky i'm the daddy i heard you've been calling out everyone else's name I can't aim mine. Are you ready? Because I'm ready. That is dangerous Daniel Dubois calling out Philippe Pergovic after His Excellency Turkey Al Sheikh made a public offer to Philippe to fight a top heavyweight of his choice on the undercard of Joshua versus Ngannou. And Daniel aspires to be that heavyweight. He wants to fight Philippe Pergovic, and I want to see it. Daniel Dubois, who was recently ordered by the EBU to take on unbeaten Granit Shala after after Riyad Murhi dropped out. Riyad Murhi, who basically retired Olympic gold medalist Tony Yoka. Afterwards, the EBU ordered a fight between him and Daniel, but I guess Riyad, he didn't want to know. He doesn't want to find out. My thoughts. I don't really get the sense that Daniel, here and now, is all that concerned with the uh, EBU title. I think he wants to continue to box on the world scene, on the world stage. He's coming off that big win over then unbeaten Jarrell Miller. And I think that Daniel Dubois, he found out something about himself in that fight. He found himself, his confidence after being accused of giving up in the Joe Joyce fight and giving up in the Oleksandr Yusik fight. He redeemed himself, he found himself. That makes him dangerous. I'm actually happy for him because I didn't have all that high of an opinion of Daniel Dubois. I didn't actually think he was gonna make it past Jarrell Miller, but he did. And in doing so, he's found his mojo. He's found his confidence, his voice. He's calling out Philippe Pergovic, and the question is, will Philippe Pergovic answer the call? Philippe Pergovic, who was last in action on the Day of Reckoning card, opposite the ring, the grossly overmatched Mark Demori, who he took care of in a short while. Oh, you can hardly give him credit for it. It's Mark Demori. Wait, it breaks down. Philippe Pergovic is in a pole position by way of the IBF to challenge for the IBF title as soon as Oleksandr Yusik and Tyson Fury settle up with each other. Whoever wins is going to have to answer to him or surrender the red belt, surrender the IBF title. So as you can imagine, when he's on the cusp of becoming a world champion or 
fighting for a world title, he's gonna tread carefully. I don't know if he's gonna answer the call. I don't know if he's gonna wanna box Daniel Dubois. Turkey al Sheik offered him an opponent of his choosing. A laundry list of names, a laundry list of fighters in Daniel Dubois, Martin Bacoli, Frankie Sanchez, Jarrell Miller, Agit Kabayel, Jared Anderson. And these are not easy fights. Not easy fights for Philippe Hergovic was failed to impress me. These are not gonna be easy outs like Mark DeMori was an easy out. You're gonna have to earn your money this time. What fighters do, usually do, in these situations is they mitigate the risks. When they're so close to fighting for an alphabet title, they don't wanna go taking on risky opponents, but that's what these opponents are. Dubois, Bacoli, Sanchez, Miller, Caballel, Anderson. These ain't keep busy fights. These are not Mark DeMori fights. Philippe Pagovic doesn't really have a choice. He may be in the queue to fight for an alphabet title, but he's not about to do that just yet. First, Tyson Fury and Oleksandr Yusik have to settle up with each other. Yeah. So what does Philippe want to do? Does he want to sit on his hands and wait, play it safe, or will he answer the call? Of this laundry list of names, will he choose someone to keep busy with? Will he choose to fight? Well, even if he does choose someone from this laundry list of names, there's no telling if it's gonna be Daniel. Yeah. He might decide to fight the guy that Daniel beat. Yeah. He might decide to fight Jarrell Miller. I like the idea of Dubois versus Hagovic because Philippe Hagovic, in spite of his decorated amateur background and that he actually medaled in the Olympics, he's a very slow, cumbersome heavyweight who's just not very impressive. And Nothing about him really stands up, whereas Daniel, Daniel is more explosive. There is more snap on Daniel's punches than what you get from Philippe Pergovic. And now that he's riding high and he's confident, that makes him dangerous. Nobody ever did anything that was difficult to do by telling themselves that they couldn't do it. But Daniel did it. After faltering against Joe Joyce and faltering against Oleksandr Yusik, he picked up the pieces, he rebuilt himself, he got himself back in the winner's bracket, and he had to go to the well to do it. Because Jarrell Miller's the kind of fighter to where if you don't fight him off and you don't get him off of you, he's gonna wear you out and he's gonna wear you down. He's gonna smother you. Pressure fighters do that. They don't give you much of a choice. You have to fight. If you're gonna win, you have to fight them off, and Daniel fought him off. Daniel stopped him, and in doing so, regained his backbone, regained his confidence. If anything, he's grown from it. Confident fighter is a dangerous fighter. A confident fighter throws their power shot with conviction, with commitment, with intention. Punching with intention. Bad intentions. Daniel Dubois impressed me a hell of a lot more in that Jarrell Miller fight, a hell of a lot more than anything I've seen from Philippe Hergovic. And I very much like the idea of a fight between them, but we don't know here and now if Philippe Hergovic is gonna bite. Is he gonna roll the dice? Does he wanna fight Daniel? If he doesn't, I suppose that Daniel can elect to fight for that EBU title against that unbeaten guy. What's his name? Daniel can do that while he waits for the next big name or the next big fight to roll around, add to his momentum, and keep it going, whether he gets that Philippe Pergovic fight or not. I like his attitude, I like his confidence, I like the headspace that he's in and the air about him that he has around him. That's the spirit. One loss, two losses, it doesn't have to be the end of the world, and no matter what they're saying now in boxing, you're always one fight away from a career best performance.